Alan's old, rusted exhaust cuts a lonely figure, abandoned outside, its purpose now reduced to a mere template. Bleak indeed. This episode can only get better, surely. So I went shopping for some 304 grade stainless steel in various shapes. The jigsaw puzzle was about to begin. This is today's jigsaw puzzle. Because this exhaust can't just come off the shelf, it's, a, it's an unusual shape and has to fit around all sorts of different uh, bends and turns, we're going to have to put the whole thing together, of course, from scratch. Luckily, I do have the old exhaust to use roughly as a guide, but I do want to move where the silencer is, and also there's going to be a support about halfway along, so the design will be slightly different. Anyhow, I've got all the raw ingredients here. I've got all the various collars and uh, 90 degree um, bends. They're all mandrel. Uh, bent, which means that they should have a, um, a fixed radius as they go around the corners, which is the best way of doing it. You can get cheaper um, types of bends and, uh, and different shapes, but this is the way to go, I think. And um, so it's now just a case of really cutting all the different lengths to shape, particularly in the stern end of the, of the exhaust where it has to go around quite a few twists and turns. Um, and so I don't run out of space so that when the welly guy gets his, uh, gets his job going, <laughs> I don't cause him too many headaches. Aside from simple pipe, there's a flexible section and a ready-made extra-long silencer. The system is going to be based around a 2-inch diameter, so that's 508 millimeters. And so all of the main sections of pipe and all the twists and turns are that diameter, and the collars are obviously set to have an internal diameter of that so that they fit over all of the different pieces. Uh, I've also had the, um, the two flanges laser cut to the correct size. Enter from stage left, my large grinding machine or more likely just plonk down in the middle of the stage, as it's rather heavy. I worked from the stern end forward, and built the assembly roughly copying the shape of the original, including of course the U-bend, which has stopped the pipe from flooding in rough seas. I wasn't entirely sure whether the weldy guy would appreciate, or indeed need, neatly finished ends, but I did a quick tidy up anyhow. Masking tape together, the various sections took on a moderately more coherent form, and I did shorten some of the collars to force the pipe into necessarily precise angles. For some reason, I also ended up with a spare bendy bit, which was odd. The silencer came without end collars, so I had these reducers custom made by a chap on eBay. The good news was that I had not made a complete Horlicks of it, like cutting an important section too short. You will be devastated to hear that I have not followed my usual policy of learning new techniques from scratch and do it yourselfing it but even I realise this needs to be done properly, quickly, and on the first attempt. Enter expert, wealthy person, and all-round boatyard magician, Dean. We started on the easy sections that I was positively certain about, and an advantage of having the work done in the yard meant I could run the fast-growing exhaust system backwards and forwards between the workshop and Alan to check the fit as we progressed. And yes, I did investigate the pros and cons of collars versus butt welds, but don't let that stop you from getting cross in the comments. It cost me more money as there were more welds, but they better assured the assembly's straightness and speed it up. There wasn't really much I could do, aside from to double check the correct pieces of metal were being attached to the correct other pieces of metal and irritating Dean by rushing around with my cameras. The awkward jobs we left to second to last. First, the flexi section. I know some people don't like these, as unavoidably, the inner layer of corrugated steel is thinner than normal pipe, so they can fracture, but they reduce the stiffness of the exhaust, so may avoid vibration cause mischief elsewhere. Then the difficult job of angling the welding rods so that the collars could be attached to the silencer ends. It was a good move though, and worth the effort, says I, not having done it. After a good clean up with an acidic paste that threatens to kill you in a bewildering number of ways, comparison time. In case you're unsure, the new exhaust is the one at the top. I've not done a direct clone, as you can see, and for those of you galvanic corrosion enthusiasts, no, I don't think the rusty demise of the old exhaust was due to those still shiny stainless steel nuts and bolts. The welds look neat to a welding novice like me, which I gather is a sign of a job well done, and I was assured that he erred on the side of caution and cut no corners, the joys of charging by the hour. We weren't done yet though. The final flange to meet the turbochargers had to be welded on board. The angles were demanding, so along with the other laser cut flange, we carted the welding machine and its owner aboard Allen. 
I was rather more useful this time round. Deployed to simultaneously hold the flange millimetre perfect, jam a finger behind the silencers so enough space remains for the lagging, and then looking away, as apparently my budget sun specs are no match for the onslaught of the brilliance at the hot, sparky end of the operation. Our dream team became one of total trust, given the proximity of my fingers to said sparky things. Once tacked into place, Dean did a double reinforcement of the weld to ensure it was rock solid. But it wasn't time to bolt everything together just yet. I never let you have anything that simple. It all had to come back out of the boat for more work in the sunny autumn weather. I thought I'd quickly show you the newly welded flange and the wiggly bit. Then the dreaded lagging job. I investigated a number of higher tech, more exotic and certainly more expensive ways to lag the exhaust, but I've stuck with glass fibre. The pipe is stainless, so can handle a little moisture if the glass does get damp. But since Alan is to be fired up and run much more often than in his previous life in service as a lifeboat, high temperatures should see to that. The first layer is braided glass rope, a thinner one over the silencer as it's already lagged inside, and then a thin glass fibre cloth to tidy everything up. Also, I'm sealing the whole lagging bonanza in a foil tape with a special high temperature adhesive. This is to keep everything neat and to stop loose glass fibres from escaping, as they always seem to, and getting all over everyone and everything, and to give it a wipe clean surface. I appreciate that all sealing of this type is imperfect, and if any dampness gets through, it'll not leave as easily, even if the pipe is two or three hundred degrees, but we all must bear our unresolved struggles in life. The special adhesive on the tape is good, but not that good. It won't stay bonded to hot pipe itself. So I'm wrapping the two ends in exhaust pipe repair cloth first, and then taping over and back onto the lag section. I was happy with the end result, and in my victory lap of lagging enthusiasm, I'd realised I'd completely forgotten something. Two things, actually. So, surgery. Not quite cutting-edge keyhole, more a brutalist, anaesthetic-free, 18th century sort of affair. I fixed in a stainless bracket for the mount, as exhaust with flexi sections need additional support in the middle, and also an aluminium anode, just in case. I stitched the lagging back up, and you'd never know I'd messed up, unless you own up and tell everyone on YouTube. There is a single finishing touch, and that's matching the length of the pipe downstream of the stern flange from the old pipe to the new pipe. It turns out to be exactly 50 millimeters long, I was running out of day, but to be honest it's the camera settings at dusk that make this look darker than it really was. I promise I wasn't actually grinding in pitch darkness. That would be an odd thing to do. Alas, mating the exhaust to the turbocharger wasn't to be as easy as I'd hoped, so out came the tools. The combination of the exhaust being quite close to the side of the engine bay, and the limited clearance on the reverse side of the flange, the studs available, and the aerotype locking nuts I've chosen, means I'm doing away with both the old studs, but also the longer new ones I'd bought. They do need to be longer, as the new nuts are quite tall. Having checked with someone who knows, it turns out that a continuous thread stud is no monumental disaster as long as the fixings on either side are totally secure, and since I have plenty to hand, I decide to slice the heads off suitably sized bolts. Aside from delivering this episode with yet more grinding accomplishments, it meant I could quickly shape the ends so they smoothly accepted nuts. Shockingly, after all this, I didn't finish the assembly in time for the edit, but I do need to show you something before we draw to a close. So, pretend for me that we're looking at the completed, lagged exhaust with the new studs and the aerotite nuts. I give you the leak test before the lagging went on. I don't have a pressure or smoke tester, so we've gone old school. Soap and water. Having liberally coated all the joins with the gloopy fluid and seen no evidence of bubbles, and then gone back over the joins I considered higher risk a second time, I'm confident. I had to do this quickly as I didn't want the flange gasket to heat up enough to begin bonding permanently. Good news, it popped off fully intact. I'll probably show you the missing finale of that fully mounted and finished exhaust as an addendum to a future episode, so hold on for that. If any of you become fretful and vexed when you see a task 99% completed but not actually finished, I suppose this is a good opportunity to train yourself out of it. My other videos probably aren't good supporting material, but this time lapse is rather smart. So let's call it quits on that note. Bye.